Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here, and in this video we're going to be taking a look at every way to level in Final Fantasy XIV. Now we're going to be mostly focused on combat jobs, but we are going to make mention of a few methods that'll help you out with crafters and gatherers as well. We're also going to be referencing some other videos that I've made regarding some of these features for those of you looking to get a bit more in-depth information about any one individually. So keep an eye out for that eye in the top right corner of the video. With that, let's get started. So before we talk about the actual ways that you will level, it's important to note that Final Fantasy XIV gives you a ton of ways to earn bonus experience points from the activities you're already doing. So we should probably cover those first. First up is probably the most notorious one in Final Fantasy XIV, the Road to 70 buff. This is a bonus given to players who make new characters on specifically marked preferred worlds when they make them. These worlds are generally lower population, so they want to incentivize players to play on them. Usually, as soon as they get preferred, though, you may even find that they're locked from new characters because they're overburdened with everyone trying to get this bonus. The bonus itself is a 100% bonus to experience gained from all sources for either 90 days or until the world is no longer preferred. Now, this bonus will last for whichever one of these conditions is around longer. So if you're on a preferred world and it remains preferred for more than 90 days, the bonus will go past that. If you made a character on a preferred world and the next day it was no longer preferred though, you'd at least keep that bonus for the 90 days. Now Road to 70 stacks with all other forms of experience points buffs and it is highly recommended for new players. Any video where someone talks about being level gated by the main scenario or having any sort of leveling issues whatsoever from one to 70, this will eliminate it as long as you have it for those 90 days or more. The second experience point buff is one that there's often a bit of misconception about amongst the community, and that is the armory bonus. Now this is a bonus to experience points that is granted to any combat job below your highest level job. Often when veteran players talk to new players about the armory bonus, they say it's a benefit for reaching level 80 or reaching level 70 or whatever. No, armory bonus applies to every combat job that is a lower level than your highest level job. So let's say you have a level 10 gladiator and you start leveling your level one thaumaturge. You'll have your armory bonus from level one to 10 in this case, at which point your thaumaturge matches your previously highest level class. This works at any level range, it does not require max level. So please veteran players, if you have this misconception, correct it and be sure to tell any new players about this because it's very important. Now the armory bonus doesn't apply to all EXP you gain on those combat jobs. It applies to monster kills, fates, leaves, main scenario quests, deep dungeons, and dungeon completion bonuses. Now main scenario quest is a tempting one, but remember this only applies to secondary combat classes and jobs. Now it also has tiers of bonuses. From levels 1 to 69 as of the making of this video, the bonus is 100% increased experience points to any of those sources we named. From level 70 to 80 though, the bonus drops to 50%. This will change depending on when you're watching this video, what expansion is currently out, and these bonuses may be at different level ranges. But for now, as of this video, that's what you need to know. And just like with the previous Road to 70 buff, it also stacks with all other forms of EXP buffs. So now we gotta cover some of the less important EXP buffs, but still things that are gonna be pretty important if you're playing the game for long periods of time. The first one is the Rested Experience Point bonus. This is actually a bonus granted for spending times in any sort of sanctuary in Final Fantasy XIV. This is any major city-state or any sort of etherite camp you may experience out in the world, designated by a little moon next to your EXP bar that'll tell you you're currently gaining Rested Experience. Now this is a bonus that gradually builds up the longer you stay in these sanctuaries, and it's mostly meant as a boost to players who log off or take breaks from the games for a few days. You come back and all of a sudden you've got way better boosted EXP for the next however long you actually manage to keep it. Now every time you actually gain experience points by killing monsters, it will consume your rested experience point bonus, and when the little bar that you have for your EXP is no longer lit up, then the bonus is gone. But it only applies to EXP earned from monster kills or crafting and gathering. This means it can last for several levels if complemented by other leveling methods, and you'll often see the bar just kind of push itself further and further as you're actually expending it. 
Finally, a few other EXP buffs. Eating food in Final Fantasy XIV grants a 3% buff for almost every food in the game. There's like some old promotional foods that are worth 4%, but I wouldn't expect to get those. There's also some armor pieces that actually grant you some EXP as well. The brand new ring from the Hall of the Novice is 30% EXP from monsters from levels 1 to 30. It even works from levels 30 to 31, so it's technically from 1 to 31. Uh, that you get from the Hall of the Novice. Make sure you do that. The main scenario will make you talk to an NPC that gives you access to Hall of the Novice, but you can manually go there through any of the little leaf icons that you see starting at level 15. There's also some armor sets on the Mog Station. There's some old promotional items you can't get anymore or ones from the original 2.0 Collector's Edition. Even the digital version works. Also, free companies, Final Fantasy XIV's guild equivalent, can also provide EXP buffs up to 15% though most free companies run the 10% bonus if they're running it at all. Now, if you really want that 15% bonus, there's a feature we're gonna talk about later in this video called Squadrons, which will actually reward manuals. These are like a personal substitute for those free company buffs. It doesn't stack with the free company buffs, but it will overwrite them if you have one stronger. So if you have a squadron manual for the 15% EXP buff, it will overwrite the free company buff that's 10%, essentially, you know, covering the gap. Okay, so those are all the methods of boosting the amount of experience points that you actually gain. There's other things like the dungeon completion bonus, like, you know, speed of completion bonuses, but those are part of individual leveling methods. Now we're going to talk about the actual activities that will help you level in Final Fantasy XIV. The first and most important method of leveling are your main scenario quests. This is your primary method of leveling for the first class and job that you decide to level. Now there's hundreds of hours of story told over several expansions and while it can be tempting to try and speed through it to get a job level, quite frankly, I recommend taking your time here. Final Fantasy XIV is a game that cares a lot about its story and lore. And while your low level experience will probably suffer as it's not terribly interesting right off the bat, trust me when I say it really compounds interest over time, especially when you get into the expansions themselves. Besides, the main scenario quests are mandatory. You're going to have to do them to unlock pretty much every feature in the game. And along the way, it will reward gill, gear, and introduce you to a ton of basic functions of Final Fantasy XIV. Honestly, it's hard to rate this anything but a 10 out of 10 for the first job that you want to level, but it has zero value to subsequent jobs unless you're so far ahead on the first one that you can use secondary jobs in the main scenario and actually level with those. There is a New Game Plus feature, but it doesn't give any experience, so main scenario quest 10 out of 10 on the first, but 0 out of 10 on all the rest. Now, if main scenario quests are the first thing we mentioned, side quests should probably be the second. Final Fantasy XIV has a ton of optional side quests as you play through, and while some of them do have some interesting stories and tidbits, quite frankly, I'm not big on doing them unless I, my OCD to actually clear the map is something really driving me. I would highly recommend using these on secondary jobs and not your primary one unless you really want to buffer the EXP that you have. They recently buffed the EXP a ton, especially levels 1 to 50, and if you're doing some of the other things on this list, this is just going to be overkill if you're all stacking it on one job. I will say that there are side quests you should 100% look to stop and do. Any side quest with a blue exclamation mark, your class quests, your job quests, are all vital towards your experience of unlocking new things. So blue exclamation mark quests and anything in your main scenario HUD guide should be side quests that you prioritize. Those get a 10 out of 10. Otherwise, quite frankly, side quests, even with the later ones in Shadowbringers being changed and being way better, most of them are just kind of there. So I'm gonna give this a five out of 10 just because it's so supplementary for so many levels. When you get to Shadowbringers, they can be a lot more worth it from level 70 to 80. But before that, it's gonna be up to your discretion whether or not you really care. Now, something that's not quests, let's talk about the hunting log. Now, the hunting log is a feature that's available after finishing your first level one class quest. So something you should be doing pretty early in the game. It's mostly supplementary EXP that helps in the first 10 to 20 levels, but it falls off really, really hard after that. It also only works on the classes that are available in A Realm Reborn, up to Rogue, which was introduced in patch 2.4. It also cannot be doubled up on Summoner and Scholar since it's just going to look at Arcanist. So, you know, the good news is Arcanist doesn't need to be doubled up because it levels two jobs for one. Honestly, the hunting log gets like a two out of ten, barely. It's useful for those first ten, even just the first 15 levels to do them, but it just falls off so hard afterwards. It could just be a good thing to finish. You get a ring out of finishing all of them, but it also can't be used on any expansion job. It's just it's a feature that just got replaced, forgotten and left behind. 
Next up, we have Fates. Now, these are available as soon as you step out into the world. They're gonna be those random events you see pop up all over your map, and they have all sorts of objectives that you'll have to do based on what kind of fate it actually is. Now, they're pretty good supplementary EXP, and sometimes they reward things like minions, cards, gill, achievements, and grand company seals, which, for a new player, is actually really important. But we're not here to talk about the minions, cards, and gill. We're here to talk about leveling. And if we just have to look at them from a leveling standpoint, at the early part of the game, they're really, really good. They fall off for like 40 or 50 levels, and then for the last 10 levels, they get kind of good again because there's also a currency which you can exchange for crafting materials and whatnot. But anyway, as a leveling method, it gets a five out of 10, and mostly because it doesn't scale very well compared to many of the other methods we're gonna be talking about here in this video. It's not bad by any means, but it's not something I'd go crazy doing. Next up is Leave Quests. These are available after finishing your level 10 main scenario quests. These are actually repeatable quests with limited allowances that refill by daily and stack up to 100 allowances. Now early on, kind of like Fates, they're decent supplementary EXP for combat jobs, but it falls off super, super hard. Now fortunately, Leave Quests are an incredibly good way to level crafters and gatherers, but other methods have honestly built up in so much popularity that even that kind of just isn't the main way people look to level those jobs anymore. Honestly, this gets a one out of 10 for combat jobs. I, it's hard to rate it below hunting logs because they do stay relevant, but just like hunting logs, they stopped making them for combat jobs at the higher levels in the more recent expansions. For Disciples of Hand and Land though, even though there are other really good methods, this still is like an eight out of 10. They are really, really strong and I've leveled so many jobs using leave quests over the years, even before these other methods were available. Next up, we have Guild Hests. These are available after you complete your first leave quest unlock in your starting city, and then you have to complete one follow-up quest to actually unlock them. This is tutorial style party content that should be the first thing you actually get in the duty finder itself. It gives a little bit of enhanced rewards for the first time completing them on each job, but honest, you probably won't do very many of these. The first few missions are useful because you really don't need a lot of EXP at those levels, but man, were these not meant to really be used for leveling that much past that. It does unlock a roulette, the Guild Hest roulette, but it's got so little value outside of maybe farming party commendations, or I think it gives a little bit of Grand Company seals. Honestly, it's another one of those systems that's completely abandoned after a Realm Reborn is finished. One out of 10, due to its limited usefulness. The next feature we're gonna talk about is challenge logs, and this is finally a good one after everything from the main scenario to this. It's available after finishing your level 15 main scenario Envoy quest. This will actually send you to the other major cities and unlock the airship as well. Once you've done all that, it'll be found in the Adventurer's Guild in Limsa Lominsa, in which case it'll just send you to a quick quest at the Fisherman's Guild, and then you'll be good to go. Now, when you unlock the challenge log, you actually unlock weekly challenges for completing various objectives in the game. This can reward experience points on top of Grand Company Seals, Chocobo Companion, EXP, Gill, and a bunch more things. Now, the most important thing about challenge logs is that they enhance the usefulness of various features that we've already, you know, kind of said aren't super useful. You know, you can do a few leave quests or a few fates and you'll get this weekly EXP bonus for completing them. The bonuses even scale with your current level, so you can use it on the jobs you really want it on, and then make sure that you don't accidentally finish these objectives on the one that you don't want them on. Quite frankly, this gets an eight out of 10. It's not a whole lot of EXP per week, but the Gil EXP and various other currencies are invaluable to new players. And honestly, it would be higher, but it can only be accessed weekly. So major, major good feature. Definitely make sure to unlock it and do it frequently. So other than challenge logs in the main scenario, I haven't given you much of use yet. Let's get into the useful leveling methods then. The first one we'll talk about that is really, really useful, dungeons. The first dungeons that you'll get in this game will be unlocked around level 16, starting with Sestasha. You'll be unlocking these very frequently, either through the main scenario quest or through side quests, so make sure to try and unlock as many as you can. Quite frankly, dungeons, one of the most effective ways to level any combat job. Running current level dungeons will always yield really good EXP. And on top of that, there's bonuses for swift completion or first time completion, which will make it worth even more for your time. The only exception is dungeons that are specifically levels 50, 60, 70, and 80. Those are inferior to leveling because they were added during the expansions that were relative to them, and they were never meant to really be used for leveling altogether. So you're better off with like a level 47 or 51 dungeon over the level 50 dungeon, for example. 
Now, dungeons are going to unlock all sorts of new features, reward gear, minions, mounts, and it'll be one of the core gameplay loops that you will use not only through leveling, but just through all of Final Fantasy XIV. Quite frankly, it's the most effective method as long as your queue times aren't bad. Considering how interwoven it is with the rest of the game, it's impossible to avoid doing them. It's a 10 out of 10 from me. The next feature is another major one, and that's roulettes. Now, roulettes become available upon unlocking or completing at least two instances in whatever roulette category we're actually talking about. We'll cover the different categories here in a second, but it's basically, as you would imagine, it's a random dungeon or instance that's given to you out of a category that you've actually played through, and upon completing it, you get a massive bonus. These can be done daily, which means that if you have just a little bit of time to play and you want to get a good amount of leveling done, these should be the first thing that you look at, because it's a massive daily bonus on top of whatever content you actually get. Now, as for the types of roulettes, there's all sorts of ones that exist, so we might want to break them down based on how useful they are for actually leveling. Speaking of which, the leveling roulette, the main scenario roulette, and the alliance roulette stand out as spectacular leveling tools once available, and if you only have time for three of them, those are the three that you would be best off doing. Now, other categories such as the trial roulette, the normal raids, and the level 50, 60, 70 roulettes, they're okay for shaking up the daily schedules with a bit of EXP on the side. Sometimes a really, really quick trial roulette can be a, the, just the right thing you need to push yourself forward, but they're not nearly as much EXP per time investment as the previous three that we mentioned. Now, there are also guild hest roulettes, there's also PvP roulettes, and while those do have their uses, they definitely start to, you know, wean off of actually being part of your daily rotation unless you're particularly interested in that style of content. Max level roulettes also are not for leveling at all. You're max level already, you can't level anymore. Honestly, roulettes also get a 10 out of 10. If you only have time to complete a few roulettes a day when you log in, or if that's the only way you want to level a job instead of grinding it out, this is the way to do it. That's how I leveled so many jobs. Just every day, log in, do a few roulettes, get a level and a half, maybe two if I'm lucky, and that's it. And I have every job at 80, so this was a key part of it. Um, one of my favorite ways to casually level an alternate job, 10 out of 10. Next up, we have Deep Dungeons. Not to be confused with normal dungeons, but we'll explain that in a second. The first Deep Dungeon you unlock, Palace of the Dead, becomes available at level 17 after completing Copper Bell Mines. Once you've done that, head to New Gridania, do the quest The House That Death Built, and it will unlock the entrance to Palace of the Dead at Quarrymill in the South Shroud. Now, a Deep Dungeon is actually a roguelike dungeon crawler with no defined roles. Your gear is useless in there and you'll have to completely power up from scratch using an entirely new progression method. It uses something completely unique that just isn't applied anywhere else and even in other places that use a system like it, it doesn't overlap with Palace of the Dead. Now, that is a very basic description about it, but if you want guides for this, I got guides galore. While I'm explaining this, look at the eye in the top right, because there's going to be a bunch of different videos there with a bunch of different explanations of the different deep dungeons. Now, for Palace of the Dead, floors 51 to 60 are the ideal leveling floors and can be used to level any job right from level one. You need that initial level in order to unlock it, but then for any of your other jobs, you can start going into Palace of the Dead right at level one if you really want to. The only annoying thing is you'll need to progress through floors one through 50 first and complete some additional quests to get from 51 to 60. Now, that can be kind of annoying, but once you do it, you're pretty much all set with Palace of the Dead anyway. Now note, there is a second deep dungeon. Heaven on High, the Stormblood deep dungeon, can be unlocked after finishing the level 63 main scenario quest in the Ruby Sea, and then doing that unlock quest. That's useful for leveling from 61 to 70, and floors 21 to 30 are the preferred method for leveling there. Now I could do an entire video about this, in fact, I've already done multiple, so I'll just give you the grade. I give it an eight out of 10. It's a really good leveling method, but oh, it's so boring. Also, the queues are reasonable thanks to the role list design most of the time, but Dungeons and Roulettes have lengthened the queue times for these significantly from the older days, just because they've adjusted so many other features. If you can get those queues, if they're somewhat at an okay pace, eight out of 10, but just be ready, it's not super fun. Now to bring your spirits down a little bit, the next method of leveling we're going to talk about is PvP. Now PvP becomes available in Final Fantasy XIV starting at level 30 from your grand company. And it's pretty straightforward. You go in PvP and you'll gain PvE EXP. Now, cues for this are usually really poor unless a specific event is going on, such as the Mughal Tombstone event. It would be an okay leveling method. They've made multiple adjustments to try and get the values just right. And even though the values aren't great, you know, just to shake things up, it would be good if PvP was popular or fun. But I'm here to tell you that 
In my opinion, it's neither of those things. The cues just aren't frequent enough, and it just isn't warranted to use over other methods unless you really, really like it, or again, there's an event going on. Not to mention that new players might not really want to level with PvP, because PvP has entirely different skills than PvE. You're going to forget how your PvE job plays when you get out at the end, so this gets a, like a 2 or 3 out of 10, honestly. I don't care. Don't do it. Just, just don't do it to level, please. Next up, we got Beast Tribe quests. Now, this is a bit of a, well, beast to talk about, because there's different availability based on which tribe in which expansion. A Realm Reborn Beast Tribes are available like late 30s, early 40s. Heavensward Tribes are available at 53 and 57, based on story progress. Stormblood Tribes around 63 and 67, and then Shadowbringers Tribes around level 73. There are also Crafting and Gathering Tribes throughout the various expansions, which are actually really good for leveling those respective Disciples of Hand and Land, but we're mostly focusing on the combat ones here. Just bear in mind that the Crafting and Gathering ones, good. Use those to level Crafters and Gatherers if you want to do so casually. As for combat jobs, they're also a really good source of daily EXP, though really from Heavensward onward. The Realm Reborn tribes just are quests at specific levels. However, from Heavensward up, the Beast Tribe quests actually scale to the level of the job that you accepted them on, so they become a really good daily method of gaining experience points regardless of which level you are, as long as it's within that expansion's level range. On top of that, you earn reputation with Beast Tribe quests, which will unlock more lore, cutscenes, mounts, minions, emotes, materia, all sorts of things. One of the only downsides is that you're limited to 12 quests overall per day from all the beast tribes, so there's a lot of them. You won't be able to do all of them, so make your decisions carefully. This gets a 6 out of 10 for me. They're quick, easy, they cover a wide variety of level ranges, but the limit on both the individual tribe quests per day and the overall 12 limit knock off a lot of points. Along with the Realm Reborn tribes just not really being that good for leveling, especially compared to the expansion equivalents, I could go as high as a 7, but again, not because of efficiency so much as they're just really easy to do and there's so many other things you actually unlock from them. So, 6 to 7 out of 10, one of the two. Let's move on. Okay, here's one that I have been advocating for for ages. I have a video with over 100,000 views already that is on this feature, and I highly recommend you go take a look at it. We're talking about squadrons next. Now, squadrons are a feature tied to your grand company and become available after you get to second lieutenant, meaning you're gonna need a bunch of grand company seals through whatever method you can get them before you can even unlock squadrons. You'll probably be level 50 or higher by the time you unlock it. Simply put, it's a team of NPCs that you recruit by completing challenge logs and then level up and bring them into low-level dungeons. At first, you'll be sending them out on automatic missions to complete their first advancement quest at level 20. At this point, you can use them to run a bunch of dungeons throughout A Realm Reborn and even into Heavensward. Now, they start off kind of slow, but as you run dungeons with them, they're actually going to power up and get faster and faster and faster. And this just means you're going to have your own NPC crew that's really, really efficient at going through a bunch of leveling dungeons. This is a 9 out of 10 for me. It is easily the first or second best method of leveling alternative jobs between levels 20 and 55. You can even go further than that, but it starts to get questionable whether or not you want to because the dungeons themselves actually get a little bit harder to run squadrons with really quickly. Its biggest downside is it's a relatively hidden feature with a somewhat steep learning curve that gradually gets faster as you do it more. Definitely check out my squadron video because that goes into way more detail about this. Now let's jump right from squadrons into trusts. Now trusts are currently available after unlocking the first Shadowbringers dungeon at level 71. And they're similar to squadrons, it's a party of NPCs you'll be running dungeons with, but they're more intelligently programmed, and they are tied strictly to level 71 to 80 dungeons at the moment. That could always change in the future. They're good for leveling in that range with dungeons if your queue times are long or kind of simply you just want to play alone for a bit and just kind of, you know, relax. This gets an 8 out of 10. It's basically the same as squadrons and dungeons, but with a little bit less of a headache. Putting this just below dungeon grade because it's a lot slower than most dungeon runs since the trusts aren't the greatest at DPSing or handling big dungeon pulls. That being said, if you don't know these dungeons going in for the first time, doing them with trust can help you learn the dungeon mechanics, since the AI is programmed to do them correctly most of the time. I give it like a high, like an 8.9 out of 10. Now let's jump back down a little bit and jump to The Hunt. Now The Hunt is available at level 50 upon getting second lieutenant with your grand company. Now a Realm Reborn hunts that unlock at level 50 aren't used for leveling. They're just used for earning allied seals, which is a whole nother video altogether. 
check the top right corner. But all the expansions have daily hunt bills that you can unlock that not only reward hunt currency, but also reward experience points. It's basically the replacement for hunting logs level 50 plus and works on any job you want to do it on. It's a much superior experience overall compared to the hunting log and rewards superior experience. This gets a six or seven out of 10. It's a really solid daily leveling method. The hunt currencies can be used to purchase all sorts of useful stuff, most notably etherite tickets that allow you to nullify the cost of teleports, but they are limited in how many you can do per day. And it's not like it's a crazy high amount of experience. It's really for the mixed function of getting experience and seals, as well as just kind of shaking up the daily leveling experience, I suppose. Learn more about that in my recent hunt video. Next up is Wondrous Tales. Now this becomes available upon finishing the 3.0 Heavensward main scenario quest and then unlocking it in Idleshire. All these Wondrous Tales are, are little books that ask you to complete a bunch of objectives in order to scratch random stickers for all sorts of prizes. Now this has been in the game for a really long time, but they very recently added experience points for simply completing the grid, regardless of how many lines you get. It scales with level and it is a massive, massive chunk of experience once per week. Honestly, this gets a 7 out of 10. It doesn't really, I don't really know if that's what it deserves, but it's a huge chunk of weekly EXP for so little effort. It's really easy to do with like a level 80 job and unsyncing it on most weeks, and then you just turn it in on a non-level 80 job. There's also a chance to earn some big rewards, some even selling for big gill on the market board. So this one gets like also a 6 or 7 out of 10. Now the last major leveling method I'm kind of adding to this preemptively because it is going to be a leveling method. It's gonna be coming pretty shortly after this video is released, but I can't give it a grade because we don't know how effective it is yet. And that is the Bajjan Front. Now this will be available after hitting level 80 and finishing the 5.0 main scenario quest. It will also require you to finish the Stormblood Alliance raids, the Return to Evilly series, and then there's a solo quest that unlocks the Resistant Weapon quest line. Once it's unlocked, it can be used to level from level 71 to 80. It'll also sync you up to level 80 and item level 430 for the entire experience. So you can do all of 71 to 80 with your level 80 skills and even work on some level 80 items that you can have waiting for you at that point. Now, all you're gonna be doing is running around and completing various objectives to level up. Simple, but we don't know how effective it's gonna be. We know there's not going to be a deep dungeon from level 71 to 80, so we'd assume it would be about as effective as Palace of the Dead or Heaven on High. But Shadowbringers has been giving a lot more experience points to players in all the features that have also been available in earlier expansions. So there's a chance that it's even better than those. Preemptively, that means it's probably at least an eight out of 10, but I guarantee you a lot of people will be leveling in there. The only question is, how many of the Boston fronts are we gonna be used to, using to level? Because the Southern Boston front is the one we're getting in patch 5.35, and there will be more after that. So that's a question mark. Maybe all of them can be used. Maybe they'll all be the same rate, but we need to wait and see. So that was gonna be the end of the leveling video because that's the last major one. But right before I started doing the Bosch in front section, I remembered a couple of other little things that can give you just a bit of EXP on top of what you're already doing. So I wanna make mention of those here. The first one I call discovery bonuses. Basically you get a little bit of EXP rewarded for discovering sections of a map or uncovering the full map altogether. You'll notice this whenever you zone into a new map, you'll see a little bit of EXP pop up saying you discovered the zone. Um, it doesn't work in dungeons, it's just for the overworld maps, but it's nice to get a little little bit of extra exp when you're going throughout the maps and you know getting your levels there there's also the sightseeing logs this is actually a feature unlocked at level 20 in new gradania from the quest a sight to behold heavensward stormblood and shadowbringers also have sightseeing log unlocks in dravanian forelands rolgers reach and crystarium respectively Pretty simply, you just discover vistas and then you do an emote at them. Usually it's slash lookout, but depending on which one it can be slash prey or another one, there's all sorts of guides for it on the internet for the various level ranges in which you'll experience these. And upon actually fulfilling the conditions for the vista, you'll get a little bit of EXP and even reveal some lore on that location. It's really nice for the lore heads in particular, but if you see one of these little sparkling spots on the map, just go to it and type slash lookout and see if it fulfills the condition and you get a little bit of EXP for your troubles. Okay, and with that, I need to wrap up this video. It was a tough one, guys. My brain is not all where it needs to be right now in this recording, and I think the flubs speak for that 
themselves. So thank you for putting up with this really long video. If you have anyone who wants to know anything about leveling, send them here. If you have anything else that I missed or you want to add some crafting and gathering related tips such as Ishgard restoration, more information about leave quests or anything like that, throw that in the comment section because I know we didn't go too much into that detail in this video. But thank you everyone for watching. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share. And stay tuned for more 14 videos. I'll see you all in the next one. And until then, take care.